We're here with Ian Raymond from uh, the Winnesquam High School, and we're going to speak about their uh, chip boiler. Thanks for being with us. Thank you. Um, so the project started back in 2007 when the town passed an ordinance to um, create an energy committee. And I was on board with helping to get that passed and then I was also the first person to volunteer to be part of that committee. Um, so uh, being the first member, we had trouble finding other members to actually form a committee. We had, a, had to have a minimum of three people. Um, so it took us six months to find at least three people to join the committee. Um, once we had the committee going, I was elected the chairperson, and I worked with the town. You know, I, I, I was a newbie; I didn't know an awful lot about the energy efficiency things. Um, so I attended a few workshops and, and uh, worked with the town and with PSNH to do electrical upgrades at the town buildings, and we did uh, lighting upgrades and everything at all of our municipal buildings. And while I was doing the uh, walking through the energy audit with, um, I believe it was Atlantic Energy. Um, Charlie Cote would, got on the phone, had a phone call from the superintendent at the school here and informed me that they were going to do a lighting upgrade at the school and at the time I thought that's crazy for a school to do just a lighting upgrade. You know, that's like the low hanging fruit that would make it so that later on when major projects like heating systems come due they wouldn't be able to make them um, financially viable uh, with grants and things. So. As soon as I heard that, I contacted Tammy Davis, the superintendent of the school district, and talked to her about it. That you know, it's not a good idea to do just the low-hanging fruit. You know, with the town that worked because there was not a whole lot of other financing for larger projects. But with the school, um, you know, the school building aid, there was utility rebates, there was uh, performance contracting because it's such a big project. Generally speaking, performance contracting energy service companies don't want to deal with projects that are under a million dollars. Um, so, knowing all of those things, because I'd gone to um, a conference with uh, Sarah Smith from UNH Cooperative Extension and um, Rick DeMarc from North Country Resource Conservation and Development, and there were a couple of other speakers, um, Kamala Shidoshi uh, from Biomass Energy Resource um, in Vermont. Um, so anyway, they had given a conference about the idea of doing wood chip boiler, or just doing biomass in particular. And it seemed like it made a great deal of sense to me. And back in 2008, when we were first talking about doing all this stuff, um, you know, oil had jumped up to close to, I think it was $3.50 or $4 a gallon at that point. And the school system, the school district had not budgeted for that kind of an expenditure for oil. You know, their oil prices had virtually doubled in less than a year. Um, so it had created a huge problem for them. So they were relatively open to my ideas of switching fuel sources. Um, so I got together with Tammy and with the chairman of the school board and we formed our own committee to um, research ESCOs, the energy service companies. Um, and we wound up going with Honeywell um, just because they had had a very good reputation and some of the other, other energy service companies like Siemens required proprietary, proprietary um, equipment that meant that you couldn't go down to Home Depot and get a replacement part if you had a breakdown. Um, so we decided to go with Honeywell. Honeywell came in and did an audit and they did an audit of all six school buildings even though the biomass plant is only for the high school and middle school which are both on the same campus. Um, they did the energy audit and determined that it was financially viable to put in a biomass plant um, and that it you know, generally speaking, biomass plants save about 59% on heating bills every year over uh, using fuel oil. Um, and that there were also enough other upgrades to do that we could do it as a performance contract, meaning that the money that you save on energy bills goes to pay for the construction and all the energy upgrades. Um, and that worked great because the oil was close to $4 a gallon at that point. So. The, the way the energy service contract work, performance contract works is that if oil is at four dollars a gallon it costs you a certain amount to heat these buildings and if chips, wood chips I think at that point were about forty five dollars a ton the difference in cost between heating with oil and heating with wood chips there was a great difference in the cost of those two things so it made it so that it could pay for the, the work to be done however by the time we 
went through all the political stuff of voter approval and, you know, first the school board had to approve it and the budget committee and then the voters. By the time we got done all of that, um, it was late 2008, early 2009, and the oil prices had dropped down to like a buck 85 a gallon and the performance contract no longer worked. There wasn't a great enough differential in price between oil and wood. Um, so at that point, after investing so much time in the project, I couldn't give up on it. So I went to the school building authority, New Hampshire School Building Authority, and gave them a presentation and got a, a grant, an era funded grant, in the amount of $1.2 million. Um, and that chunk of money made it so that the difference between the, the full project cost and the amount that we got for the grant allowed us to do the performance contract. And what was the full price of the uh, project? The project itself, the actual construction cost was three point, but somewhere between 3.6 and 3.8 million. And then the financing cost on top of that brought it up to 5.2 million. So by getting the $1.2 million grant, it dropped it down to roughly $4 million project. And then we were able to get $30,000, $31,000 and change um, in utility rebates. We, Because we're a regional school district, we got New Hampshire School Building Aid um, in the amount of 50% of the project cost. Um, so the combination of all those things made it so that it had no increase in the property taxes for the residents of the school district. It was a self-funding project. It didn't affect the tax rate at all. Um, and looking into it, you know, we, we looked into both wood pellets and wood chips, but the savings on wood chips, because it's a less processed product, um, were basically double what the savings would have been with wood pellets. Um, so wood chips made a great deal of sense to do here. Um, in addition to that, we replaced the lighting in all the six school buildings. Um, I think there was 2,638 lights that got replaced. They did weatherization on all the building envelope uh, upgrades in all of the school buildings. Um, they were able to replace a boiler, I believe, at the middle school. Um, it was a big enough project, too. One of the things with school building aid is that you cannot use school building aid for deferred maintenance issues. So if the school system decides that they don't want to replace a roof or something, um, the school building aid won't help them out later on when the roof is leaking and their, you know, the building is getting destroyed. But because we're doing such a big project, um, school building aid kicks in if the project you're doing is equal to 25% of the capital asset value or more. And by doing a project this large, it allowed them to tack a lot of other things into school building aid that otherwise wouldn't have been allowed. So they were able to do um, a boiler. I believe there's one here at the middle school that they did, and I think they may have also done one at the Samerton Central School. Um, and then they were able to replace a roof on the agricultural building here at the high school campus um, and there were a few other things that wouldn't have been allowed in the school building yet otherwise. So that worked out great. Um, some of the other pitfalls that we, or obstacles that we ran into along the way were, were that um, in 2008 when the oil prices had dropped and it was no longer looking like it would be a self-funding project, both the school board and budget committee unanimously voted against the project, which was incredibly disheartening. It's like, oh, you know, this is, it's still an important project. Oil's not going to stay at a buck eighty-nine a gallon. Um, so it was after that point that I'd gotten the grant and that made it so that uh, the school board was on board with uh, doing the project. So I think that that's kind of a rough summary of what we did. Can you tell me about the uh, technology that you're using here? It's a Messerschmitt um, wood chip boiler with a Hearst, uh, I'm sorry, wood chip furnace with a Hearst boiler on top of it. It uh, puts out 5 million BTUs. Um, it's connected to the high school and the middle school on two separate loops, one for each school. Um, and because this is a, it's a regional school district with three towns going to it, um, it's also an emergency shelter, and in New Hampshire, the law states that if you are running an emergency shelter, you cannot have wood as the only source of heat. You have to have a backup source. So what we did was we were able to keep the fuel oil fired boilers at the high school in the loop as well, so that if um, you know if there's an issue where for some reason the wood 
plant isn't working, they can uh, kick on the oil boilers. And the way that the, the wood-fired boilers work too is that you know they, they, they are most efficient and burn most efficiently when they are going full bore. There's three different um, heat settings that they can be set at, but they work best and are most efficient when they're going full bore. And so during the shoulder seasons of spring and fall, it's generally not the best to, to uh, run the, the wood fire boiler. So by having the fuel oil boilers um, in the high school, which are they're actually dual fuel boilers, um, they're both natural gas and oil. And after we had the energy audit, those are all the boilers have been switched to natural gas, which is much less expensive. Um, so in the shoulder seasons, they can switch that on if they need to, if it doesn't look like the wood fire boiler is going to be working efficiently. The first year that they operated it, they, because they wanted to get the bugs worked out of it before the, the main part of the heating season kicked in, um, they ran it the entire season nonstop. And even that, their, their, their heating prices, they went through 832 tons of wood. Honeywell had um, projected that they would go through, I think it was 1,185 tons. So they, even though they burned the entire heating season, which was not the plan, they still burned less wood than uh, what was projected. And part of the thing with the performance contract, which is such a great thing, um, is that Honeywell guarantees the savings, the energy savings for the school. So with the Hon Honeywell's energy audit, um, you know, engineers came in, figured out exactly how much money could be saved by doing the building envelope upgrades, the lighting upgrades, some of the motors on some of the, the uh, heating equipment, um, vari variable frequency drives on the pumps. Um, all of those things the engineers can calculate very specifically how much money is going to be saved. And then, because it's a performance contract, Honeywell guarantees that savings. If you don't make the savings, Honeywell writes you a check for the difference between what they projected and what uh, you actually saved. And so far, they are far above what Honeywell projected for savings. And when they're above, they get to keep the savings, right? Yes. Yeah. And they're paying for the project out of the savings? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, the, the total saving, projected savings over the next 25 years will be $5 million. And so far they're above that, you know, they're scheduling for that as well. So far, the, the last two years that this has been running, they've saved over $300,000. How many square feet between the two schools is this? I believe it's roughly 225,000 square feet. Is there any cooling associated with this? No, no. And it's not combined heat and power either. Although um, the gentleman from Better World Energies, who was, sort of does the final installation work on these, um, he's in the process of trying to come up with a way to make these both combined heat and power, mm -hmm. where they produce electricity as well as heat by putting um, a generator of sorts into the smokestack. Can you get me some numbers for a case study so we can, you know, this is what they're paying with fuel oil, this is the cost, this is, you know. Yep. Well, I mean, maybe that's all in there. I have the Honeywell audit report. That'd be yeah. great. Is that analog? Is that electronic? Um, I don't think I have it in PDF format. I just have a physical hard copy. I'd still um, like to see it if that be okay. Sure. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Think of anything else? Um, sort of take us on a tour. Show us sure, yeah. Uh, one of the other questions that we were asked when we were first building it, one is the emissions. And when we do the tour, I'll show you that there's a multi-cyclone particulate separator, which takes the vast majority of, of, uh, of particulates out of the, the emissions. Um, and it also is healthier for the environment because there's virtually zero sulfur dioxide that comes out of it, as opposed to burning oil, which there's a lot of sulfur dioxide that comes out of the emissions from oil. Um, and from what I've read, I don't know specifically how accurate this is, but um, this size boiler, the emissions are the equivalent of um, five residential wood stoves. And yet this is heating roughly a hundred thousand, uh, I'm sorry, a hundred times the space of a single home. Cool. Thank you. Sure. So. So this chip bunker is kept empty during the summer so that it doesn't compost and catch fire um, and also to keep vermin out of the wood chips. Um, I've never actually heard of any of them catching fire, but there's a possibility, I guess. They talked about that when we went to Crotchet Mountain Yeah. about the same issue.
another um, design I, I personally think of it as an improvement is that the um, expansion tanks for this are mounted to the ceiling, those two big red tanks up there. Um, and that was all engineered specifically for this site. Some of the other schools have those mounted vertically on the floor, so the, the floor space and the plants are, are really crowded. And these are the controls for the system? Yes, yeah. This is the main control box here. And this is wired into Honeywell. Um, there's a DSL line that wires it into Honeywell so that they can keep track of how the system is working. Um, and it's also wired into the, the facility manager's computer so that they can uh, run the controls from a laptop anywhere that they happen to be, anywhere that they have an internet, internet connection. Another um, upgrade to this system, which is something that, that's a change in the Messerschmitt design, is that the um, holes that are in the firebox um, that create the draft, there's a blower to, uh, to create draft in there, uh, so it actually looks like a blast furnace when it's going. Mm -hmm. But they've got the draft holes are alternate with one another, so they sort of finger together, and it creates more of a disturbance in the air, which creates more, com a more complete burn. Uh -huh. Oh, so the... Um Auger brings the chips to right to the bottom of this um, conveyor belt. Um, I can show you how the auger thing works. Okay. Um, so this is a traveling auger. This is what feeds the chips to the boiler. Um, there's a, I think it's a 14 foot auger on the end of this motor. And the auger goes all the way to the front of the bunker, the chip bunker. Um, and it doesn't actually rust on the floor, so there's no wear and tear on the floor or on the auger. It's, it floats. The only place it's attached is to the auger motor itself. And the way that the auger works, it's a traveling auger that's attached to a motor and it's a pressure switch would be where these springs are. And so when the auger, the auger will travel, and when it hits um, the pile of chips, depending on which bunker happens to be filled, um, when it hits the pile of chips, it just tweaks the auger um, slightly one way and it puts pressure on that, that spring-loaded pressure plate and it'll switch the auger off because it knows that it's hit the wood chip pile. And then it'll start drawing, it'll turn the auger on and start drawing the chips out from underneath the um, bunker wall, the steel bunker wall here, onto the conveyor belt. And this conveyor belt is actually sort of a modified um, cattle feed conveyor. So it's a, it's a very simple mechanism. That was one of the reasons that we went with Messerschmitt here. I looked at both ChipTech and Messerschmitt, which are the two most popular biomass um, boilers going. Um, and in Vermont, there's I think 38, 36 or 38 schools now that have biomass going. And it's kind of a mix between ChipTech and, and Messerschmitt, but it seems like Messerschmitt is taking the lead lately. Um, and the reason for it is that the Messerschmitt boilers have a reputation for be having fewer problems with jams, with chip jams, and a lot of it has to do with the, this whole conveyor belt system. Um, this has been running up and running for two years now, and to my knowledge, there's only been one time when they had um, a problem with chips jamming, and it was because they got a sort of a bad batch of chips that had been iced up, um, and they, the chips had stuck together in clumps with ice. Uh, so they did go and break it up with shovels to get the, the uh, auger gun jam. But other than that, if you get a good batch of chips, there's, you know, there's virtually no problem with getting them up to the boiler. So the auger mount motor is on a huge chain drive here that will drag it back and forth across the entire bunker, chip bunker, to um, wherever the chips are located and draw the chips back out onto the conveyor here. And then the conveyor is on a switch. When we go upstairs, I'll show you how that works. It's on a switch so that it will feed into a chip distribution box when the chips are needed. So it's all automatic, there's no, you know, when we first set this up, one of the things that voters were concerned about was that it was going to require a full-time person to, to take care of it, but the entire system is automatic. There's no, the only time that an operator has to be here is for chip delivery so that they can open the door to the bunker, um, and then for about 15 minutes a day just to clean ash out of the boiler, out of the furnace. Um, other than that, there's no more maintenance to this. In fact, the, the facilities manager likes this better than the oil boilers. There's, there's less maintenance involved with dealing with this than there is with oil. Thank you.
So this is a 5 million BTU Messerschmitt boiler. Yep. And can you open it for us to show us what we see inside? A little heavier duty than your home fireplace. But it's essentially an overgrown wood stove. Yep. And I'll show you the path that the wood chips take to get in here. There's, the, there's a screen on the bottom that um, allows air to come up through the bottom as a draft and then also through the side. So there's an incredible amount of air turbulence in there when it's burning. And it's just like a blast furnace like you'd see at uh, you know, a wrought iron uh, studio. Okay. Um, Oh, I gotta lower this. We'll edit this part out. <laughs> okay, Take two here we are. Call me in the morning. <laughs> this is the clean out, and we're looking in here. And okay, so okay. there's the two augers up at the top that feed it, uh, feed the wood chips in. And right in front of those augers, you'll see that there's a shelf that's about 12 inches wide. That shelf is used so that when the when the schools are no longer calling for heat, the furnace can shut down. Um, but the shelf, the, there'll be a small amount of wood chips on that shelf that stay sort of smoldering, so that you don't have to come back out here and relight relight the uh, the boiler. Um, and then when the schools call for heat again, the chips that are up there smoldering will will catch the rest of the bed on fire again. Um, and then on the grates, there's iron grates on the floor of this with holes that allow draft to come up through the bottom. And then if you look along the sides, there's about a half a dozen holes drilled into the sides of the firebox on both sides. And that's um, where the blower draft, the, dra the draft um, induction blowers are coming into the firebox. And then you can't get the angle with that camera right now, but right here there's a huge hole. It's about the size of a manhole cover that goes up. Um, from the firebox, and that's where the heat goes up to heat the water in the boiler, which is up above the firebox. That's the first boiler that's mounted on top of the Messerschmitt um, firebox. Excellent. And then one of the other things that makes it so that this is a maintenance, basically maintenance free unit, is that there's an air compressor right behind you there, Wes. And that's on and works with sensors so that I think it's once every minute or so, or once every five minutes, something like that. It's on a timer type of a thing. Um, it's piped, this compressed air that's piped up on this black iron pipe here and comes in and goes into the boiler itself. And somewhere the heat exchanger is in the boiler, it blows compressed air and blows all the soot out of the boiler itself. And that happens on a, on a regular basis in every few minutes or so, so that um, you get a good heat exchange. The traveling of the wood chips, you know, we've checked it out in the basement already, but it continues up on this um, conveyor belt and comes into this box. Um, this box has a sensor on it, which is what this wire is. It's a photo sensor that looks through this window and it can see when there's something blocking the window so that it knows when it's full of chips. All it has to do is fill up to about here with chips. Um, and then it'll shut the conveyor down so the conveyor's not always running. It's all automated. Um, the blower fans are all automated. The wood chips then go to this section over here, which is a distribution box. This blue box here. And that's where the chips are sort of separated into two separate areas um, to go in through the two augers that you saw inside the firebox. Now, all the other pipes that you see around here, these copper pipes, and also there's a thermometer. Um, that gauges how much heat is in the auger uh, chute as well as in the distribution box, and there's another one inside of the feed box here. Um, and so that if there's ever, um, if the fire ever gets back through the auger, which is very unlikely, I've never heard of it happening, but if it were to happen, um, there's temperature gauges that know that there's a fire in the firebox, and then there's fire suppression throughout the whole unit, both in here, the sprinkler head inside this um, feed box, and inside the augers themselves. So the um, combustion air, if you see these stove pipes that are also kind of primitive looking, those are for the combustion air. Um, and so the combustion air comes through the fan box over on the wall there, and that just feeds air to the entire room, and then the air is blown into these blowers. 
Cool. And then this asbestos wrapped, well, not asbestos, but insulated, um, it's actually a stainless steel um, emissions uh, exhaust pipe going through there. And this main box here is a multi-cyclone particulate separator. So it's basically like a centrifuge like uh, they use for separating blood. Um, there's, I think there's nine tubes in there. And it will whip the smoke around in a centrifuge and it spins all the particulate matter to the outside edges of the tube and then they fall down into the barrel on the floor here. So there's very little um, in the way of particulates that go up into the smokestack. And then on top of that we have um, a 60 foot smokestack um, which helps to distribute the few emissions that are left in the, in the exhaust, um, helps to distribute it so that the local homeowners don't have any issues with it. You, never, you can never smell wood burning, you'd never know that there was a biomass plant here. And because this is so efficient at um, taking the particulates out of the emissions, um, they're not even required by the Clean Air Act to keep records. Some of the older um, biomass plants, they actually have to keep records for the Department of Environmental Services um, just to make sure that the emissions comply with the, with the laws. But um, they're not required to do that here. And then um, some of the other systems that we've got going on here are variable frequency drives which drive the pumps. Um, this is the DSL network that hooks up to computers so that the whole thing can be run by a laptop by the facilities manager or anyone else that they see fit to run it. Um, Honeywell's connected to it so they can keep track of how well it's performing. And these are the VFDs? Yeah. Yeah. A variable frequency, variable speed drive allows for a, a motor to be used at variable speeds rather than only on and off, which means that they could save a lot of money, a lot of energy and a lot of money. Excellent. And a couple more, I guess? Yeah. Yeah, there's several different pump systems working because it is pumping to two different schools, um, school buildings. Mm. And then there's also a couple of pumps up on top for the return. Thank you again, Ian. We appreciate your help. My pleasure. Great project. Thank you.